question in the message today is who's my neighbor? So I want you to do a 360 view of where you're standing. Not right now, just hang on a second. You're all so excited. 360 degree view of where you're at right now. Just do a turnaround. And I want you to look at the people that are around you. And I want you to observe and notice someone in the fellowship that you don't specifically know. All right, do the 360 right now. All right. Now some, some of you, some of you cheated. You did a 180 or a 90. We can't help it. You can't help it. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of, of relationship. You are a God who wants to be in a relationship with us. You are a God who wants to live in the community. And Father, we thank you for the word today. I thank you for the opportunity to speak it and to teach it. So let your spirit settle upon us now and let your word come alive and let us leave here. Change people because we are sitting in the presence of a holy God. And all of God's children can say, Amen. 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 You may be seated. So obviously we're talking about community today. Every person can live in a Christian community. What does that mean? What does that look like? Really, what does a Christian community look like? I think for many of us, we have a presupposition in our head that this is community. This is Christian community. And I hate to tell you, if you answered, yes, I got that one right today, you're wrong. You just failed that question. This is not Christian community. This is not all that it encompasses. This is a small piece of it. I'm going to start out this morning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. And the, the, the thesis this morning is self or savior. Ooh. Selfishness or savior. Which one do you worship? In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And by the time we get down to verse number 26, it says, Then God said, Let us, and there's a beautiful picture here of a trinity three times. Us, plural, let us make man in our, plural, image after our likeness. There it is. Three times God brings up the fact that there's a plurality to the Godhead and we're going to make this man in our image. That's pretty cool. Then he goes on to say, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping, crawling, oh, sorry, I add things sometimes, Creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse number 27, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse number 28 carries one of the most heavy emphasis in all the Bible. And God blessed them. God blessed them. I mean, that's a gift. They were blessed by God, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. And here it is again, Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the living thing that moves on the earth. Here's our first picture of community. Now, in the theater of your mind, let your imagination run once. I mean, literally, God gave you an imagination. Use it. And I want you to use it here big time. You're, you're in a place that was created by God, and there is no sin at this point. You can go ahead and close your eyes if you want to in, in the imaginary time. There's no sin. So everything is perfect, okay? The sky is bluer than blue, and the greens are greener than green, okay? There's animals that you are in relationship with. There, there's no fighting. There's no war. There's, there's peace, and you can walk through the valleys of the meadows with grass up to your waist high with a gentle breeze blowing in the beauty of the day. And you can see some cows and some, 
some lions and tigers and whatever it is, and it, it's a peaceful place. Now, now let's just take this another step further. You're Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had no parents. So when Adam and Eve talked to each other, they would say, isn't God something? He made us. We weren't born. We, we weren't birthed. We were created in our God's image as they're walking along. They didn't even know what the word grandparent was. There was no grandparent, great-grandparent. There was no tornadoes. They didn't know what hail was. They didn't know what eight-month winters were. <laughs> it was perfect. And they were in a community. They were in a relationship with God. And there was no problem. You get the picture of community? God's love coming down, their love coming up, and it's just really a good place to be. That's the picture of community. That's the picture of, of a awe to be in the presence of God and to not have any pain. Not have any tension in relationships. Relationships can get ugly. There's none of that. Perfect community. I want you to keep that picture today. Because really that's what God is talking to you about. He says, what does community look like? Here's what happened. Such an unbelievable experience to live in this awe with God, to be created and not to be birthed, and to be one with him and to be fruitful and multiply. And all of a sudden, this, this thing called serpent, the snake, Satan, the devil, whatever it is, comes in and he tempts them in this perfect world. And he says, listen, it could get better. Because you don't know the whole story right now. This thing could get, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he's tempting them in such a way that God's holding out on you. And they fall for the temptation. Sin comes into the world. We know the rest of the story. The sky turns gray. There's thistles in the field. There's pain in childbirth. Everything went south. And community was disrupted. In fact, it was so disrupted, the part of them that they were in fellowship with God died. The spirit that lived within that had the relationship with God is now severed. And this God whom they were in relationship with, whom they sat and said, he's it, we didn't exist before he made us, they now don't know. Status quo has changed. Everything got turned upside down. True biblical community was changed. Christian community, Christian fellowship with God, Yahweh, got turned upside down. Now God comes right on the scene right after that and says, listen, you can get this back. I'm going to bring a seed. He talks to Abraham. He gives him the plan. Forty-two generations later, we have this guy named Jesus come on the scene. Jesus sheds his blood. He dies. He's perfect. And by believing in him, you get that relationship back. Now, when you get the relationship back, look what it looks like in Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 25. The fruit of the Spirit. If you're not a born-again believer, if you're not confessing to believe in Jesus, you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. It can't be there because you were separated from God. But if you're a born-again believer, you have the Spirit of God that lives within you. Think of this. That God that did the creating, he lives in you. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in me. That's the mystery. Christ is in you. So you have it. You have it. And the first part of that community is love. Is love. Dana and Mike had a passion and, and a love for these two boys that they pursued adopting them. The only thing that will drive a parent to do such an act is love. Purely. Love. Fruit of the Spirit is love. Then joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. They only come to us through grace. So let me ask you this. Do you see this in your Christian community? Do you see that? And in order for me to practice patience, there has to be somebody in here that's not patient. 
somebody here that is very impatient because I have to learn to be patient with them. It's the only way I would know that. In order for me to truly love somebody, there has to be somebody in here that's unlovable. You following me? Because unless everybody's love and everybody's patient, everybody's perfect, I never get to practice my patience. I never get to practice my ability to love. So in true Christian community, we give and we take. And listen, this is extreme. This is really extreme. There's a lot of people who I would rather not love. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean because of personalities, because of, of actions and things said. It's like, really, Lord? But he says in true biblical community, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then when you love, there's peace. Is there, is there ever a time in a church where there's told peace? Is there ever a time in a, in a Christian body where it's just all good? I mean, how many of you came in here today and said, My life is so good, I have no problems, I have no pain. Hallelujah, praise God, I couldn't get any better. I never hear that. I get the phone call and says, the wheels came off of this. How many of you ever said, I, I don't want anything good? I'm just happy existing. We don't do that. That's because we long to live in the Christian community. This is extreme. I mean, really, God, sin came in. I'm broken, and I'm supposed to like people. I'm supposed to be patient with people. I'm supposed to be kind to people. I'm supposed to be good to people. That's exhausting. Just the other day, I was walking down the grocery store, and I, se I seen extreme Doritos. I mean, this is extreme. You ever see extreme Doritos? Yeah? Do you have extreme Doritos? Yeah? God, God is pushing us to the extreme, and he says, this, this is what I want you to have, and when you have the spirit of me in you, you can do this. I don't want you to raise your hands on this one, but how many, of your peop how many of you would rather not have to be in a relationship with your parents? That's extreme. But yet God says to love them. God says be patient with them. Kind. That's extreme behavior, and it's not normal because we're broken. This thing called sin came in and messed me up bad, and I don't like doing some of those things. It's extreme. And the problem we have in, in Christianity today when I'm talking about community is, is, is what we're doing here. This is the problem. Because we have a tendency to believe that when I go to church, I, I put on love. And I'm going to pull patience out of the drawer this morning because I know that one guy's going to come up and talk to me. And I'm going to have to be patient with him. I'm going to have to listen to him. So we put on these things and we come to church and we're these nice people because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. And it's something we do. Are you hearing me? Because it's not us. We just do it. And believe me, if you just do it in our human nature, and if you're a born-again believer, and the Spirit of God lives within you, you know when somebody's doing it instead of being it. I mean, have you ever talked to that person when, okay, I know I've got to approach him, I've got to talk, I've got to be kind, and you know it's just forced. It's like, how are you doing today? Fine. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, me too. I mean... So it's like, oh, hey, go get a cup of coffee. Talk to you later. You know when it's not right. It's forced. It's extreme. We have a tendency to believe in something that we pull out of the shelf, we put on on Sunday morning, and we go home and we live a totally different way. We live a lot different outside of here than in here. And God says Christian community is who you are. You're the same here as you are out there. That's the way it is. Don't think it's two different people. And he gives us a beautiful story in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and 37. He comes up to this, this guy comes up to Jesus, and we know who the guy is. He's a lawyer. And I know we have a, a lawyer in our crowd this morning, but he said, ex-lawyer, to remind you, because I'm going to pick on the lawyer for a minute. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. He wanted to test Jesus, and he calls him a teacher. So he's acknowledging that, that he's a man of authority. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? Question, 
How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all you. Now, and I know I've told you this, but when you read the Bible, you know, put it into practical setting. You know, I mean, I just slipped into it there. You know, well, you shall love. The no. What, hey, guy, how do you read the law? Jesus says. How do you read it? And the guy comes back, stoic in his lawyer, lawyer terms, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus turns to him, and I just imagine almost this chuckle on the inside, and Jesus turns to him and says, hey, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. Now here's the tension. Go back to the first verse. The teacher stood up and he said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Where's the emphasis? I. The lawyer, the educated man, says to Jesus, I want to do something to inherit an eternal life. The do, as the verb that he uses here, is what, what can I do? Teacher, can I stand up and read this book? It, it's a merited favor. Look at me, I have intelligence, I know what this book says. It's something about what he had to do, merited. So I, I want to know what I have to do. Now life here is, a, is not the same life that Jesus uses. He says, I want a life, and it's a noun, I, I want a life that I can live that's good. It's about me, okay? So it's about what he knows, it's about what he's doing, and he wants a good life. And it's interesting, he throws eternal in front of it because he's not using eternal, the Zoe life. So he says, hey, teacher, it's all about me. And Jesus comes back, jumping down to verse number 28. Jesus comes back, and if you don't catch this, and Jesus says to him, do this. The do here is a totally different verb. When Jesus says, do this, it's an acknowledgement that God, or a higher being, but specifically Yahweh, has given you the ability to love. And life here is used that you died to old self and you rose again. Totally different word than the life that the lawyer uses. So the lawyer presents the case to Jesus, what must I do? It's all about me. Jesus comes back and says it doesn't have anything to do with you. It doesn't have anything to do with you. It's about acknowledging God, the sustainer of life, and he will give you then life that you died to the old self and rose to the resurrection to the new self. Now, you don't catch all that reading that, but that's how the conversation unfolded. He's a lawyer. He's a lawyer, so Jesus just put him in his place. He's guilty. He's guilty from his statement. What must I do? Look at how Jesus responds to the guilty statement. But first, the lawyer comes back and he says, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who's my neighbor? See, he's trying to get out of this because love just indicted him. Love called him guilty because he hadn't done this. So he's trying to find a way out, and he says, who's my neighbor? Isn't that just like us? I mean, really? I come to church on Sunday morning, Jesus, and you ask me to love everybody? Well, how about if I qualify that? Who is my neighbor? I mean, do I really have to look at that guy? That's really what he's saying here. He's trying to qualify his position of not loving. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, stripped him, beat him, departed, leaving him half dead. And now chance, and now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. A Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend I will repay when I come back. And imagine the guy hearing this. And then he says, 
Which of these three do you think provided to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. The man was guilty. Love indicted him because he probably didn't love any of these like he said he did. Love your Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus tells him, and in his professional mannerisms, he really doesn't even answer him. A man was going down from Jerusalem. You know, he slips into third person and he gives him an illustration. Doesn't even tell him who, but he says a man. So if a man came from Jerusalem, it was a Jew. And of all the people to help a Jew would be a Samaritan. Nothing to do with each other. And he says, here's the picture. How many times have you been in a situation where something drastically happened to you and the people whom you thought expected, who you expected to help you never helped you? You ever have that happen? You see, the tension in this text and about our community and about the relationship that we live in, and I started out, I said, are you worshiping self or savior, is the very fact that we have to answer that question. Who is my neighbor? And I had you do a 360 before worship start, before the sermon started. And I wanted you to look around at how many people you've never talked to and how many people in your head you'd literally say, they're my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Is the piercing question. But we, we put restrictions on it. We don't want to have to love people who are different color, who speak different, who go to a different church, who think differently. Maybe they even got different theology. Maybe they even believe in a different God. And you say, really? That's my neighbor. And then you go along the road, and the person who needs help, you don't stop and help. Because he's not my neighbor. And you know what really hits home in this text? Is the two people that passed him by were me. I mean, the people in the community that they looked up to, that modeled, that taught, that was in the temple, that should have had compassion on this person, didn't. A priest and a Levite, they're from the same cloth. The Levites were the priests. These were, these were educated people. They should know. But they walked right by. You see, we want it conditional. We will help those whom we want to. And God says, that's not how it works. How many times have you had an opportunity to help, but you didn't because he's not your neighbor? How many times have you had the Holy Spirit settle upon you and say, hey, I want you to give to that person. I want you to go over to that person. I want you to mow their lawn. I want you to scoop their snow. And really, Lord, I've got to get groceries, I've got my own driveway to scoop, I've got my own agenda, I've got my own things, I've got my own stuff. And you're asking me to go help someone else. Certain people are who we will let be our neighbor. And here it is, a Levite and a priest, the man's bleeding to death. And they walk by. How many people have you walked by that are bleeding to death? I'm not talking physically that their blood is draining out on the side of the highway or sidewalk. I'm talking about spiritually. I'm talking about people whom you, you have never mentioned the word love to. And you don't mention the word. You simply greet. You shake the hand. You hug. Whatever it is. You don't walk up to a stranger that's in pain or hurting and say, Oh, I love you, man. And they'll think you're weird and they run away from you. No. You lend the helping hand. The love of Christ looks a lot different than what we presupposition it to be. Love indicted the lawyer. He was guilty and he had no way out. Jesus comes on the scene and he's telling me when I studied this and he's telling you today, you got to go through it. And if you fail this test today, guess what? It's going to come up again. It's just like a driver's license test. If you fail it and you want to drive, you've got to take it again. You've got to go through it. In order to learn to love your neighbor as yourself, you've got to push through it. If you retreat and don't do it, it's going to come up again. 
it will come up again. He couldn't get out of the situation. Jesus confronted him. And he said, you want to know who your neighbor is? You really want to know? These guys were this guy's neighbor. And they walked right past him. Grab the hand of the person sitting next to you. Now I know it's probably your spouse. It's probably somebody you know. But when you grab the hand of a person, that's my neighbor. And I don't know what you're feeling towards that person right now. But if you're a selfish, egotistical maniac, that's a pretty big term there. I know you're not all selfish, egotistical maniacs. But if it's about self, just to do what you're doing is a stretch. Because God's inviting you today to reach out his hand and let the love of Jesus Christ flow through you. Remember when I talked about the garden and in the perfect relationship? You confess to believe in Jesus, that love is in you, and that hand is an extension of God's hand. And you may not even be in love with the person sitting next to you. But extend the hand because the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Guys, if there's any of you sitting here today and you just grab the hand of your wife and you're not in love with her, you go home and pray and the first thing you ask God is to open your eyes to see her. And gals, if you're sitting next to your husband today and you grab the hand of him and you're not in love with him anymore, you take a hold of that hand and you go home and you pray and you say, God, I stood at the altar and I said, I promise to love this person for better or for worse. And you push through it. Because you can not do it. You have to do it. You can't be a big person with a small heart. Love has no boundaries. Jesus says, who's my neighbor? It's everybody. There's a guy in our congregation that just told me a story uh, last week that it was in a horrific automobile accident years ago in his life and over five cars drove by before anybody stopped to help them. Think of that. And we live in a world where we don't want to even... I got in big trouble 20 years ago from my dad because I'm, I'm going to the courthouse, the county seat in Ida Grove, Iowa, and there was a guy standing on the side of the road with a suit on. And I hit the brakes and I backed up and I gave him a ride. And I, I never forget telling my dad the story. And dad says, so what if he had a suit on? I said, he looked legit. And he said, those are the guys you got to watch out for. <laughs> we had a nice visit. We had a nice conversation. He, he had had a couple DWIs, and he had to appear in court. He couldn't drive, and he was walking about 20 miles. I gave him a ride. But we live in a time and an economy where that's dangerous, and how sad is that? We don't pick up hitchhikers anymore. We don't do those kinds of radical things. And yet that can be the very moment where the love of God steps in and changes a person's life. You have to push through it. You cannot determine who your neighbor is. So I started out the message today, self or savior. And I said if the, the self thing came up when you're sitting here, and you're egotistical and it's all about me, you're a narcissist, my life is about me, it's what I do, it's on my terms, I get to like who I like and I get to love who I love, that's okay, let that arrow pierce you today. Because we are a community church. And we can't sit in a community center behind closed doors on Sunday morning and leave here and act like nothing ever happened here. God has called us to a position to witness to the community, to witness to the surrounding communities. We're not normal. You know that. Number one, it's because you come under the umbrella of Christianity. Christians are not normal. We go against the status quo of the world. But how great is that? I mean, how great is it to have the love of Jesus in my heart and that I can, I can love my neighbor? Because it's all about the one who's in me, not about what I want to do. Verse number 37, Jesus comes back to him and says, 
The lawyer says, who, he said, the one who showed mercy is, he, is how he answers the question. Jesus says, go and do likewise. The word go here is emphatic. Empath I'm not even going to try to say that again. It's a continuous action go. But the go is that you acknowledge that you died. That the part of you is dead. This is the same terminology Jesus uses at the beginning. He says, do this and you will live. That part of you died and has rose to new life. You go and acknowledge who? Jesus the Christ, God the Father. You acknowledge that he's the one doing it. And the do here is the same do that he used up in the beginning. Acknowledge that I'm God, that he did this that now I have the authority because he did it, and likewise is homoousis. You know what the word homo means? Same as. The person who did the work. So now you go and acknowledge Jesus had the power to love unconditionally, and you act like him. This lawyer got nailed between the eyes in two different times within a short conversation. So Jesus ends this, this is what he says. If you want to pass the test and if you want to love your neighbor as yourself. Imagine if we loved our neighbors as ourselves. Imagine just one day of that. But Jesus says if you want to pass this test, it's not about you. It's not about you. And the guy came up to him and says, what must I do? It's not about you. It's about what he did. It's about how Jesus loved. It's about the unconditional love that he could give. You can't do that. There's no way. But since he did, we can. So he says, you do what I did, and then go and be like me. You see where the, the weight comes off of us. All the weight comes off of us because now we take that grain of mustard seed faith and we put it in Jesus, the one who did the action, and we can come and say, hey, Jesus did love you. I can't, but he can, but he's in me. That make sense? So once you acknowledge Christ in me, spirit in me, he says, go and do likewise, go and act like me. Now you can love. Now you can actually look at a person, I'm just using you as an example, you can actually look at a person and say, I love you, man. And I mean that. You can say, I, I can have patience with you. Man, you've been pushing me, and you've been pushing me, and I'm just about, no, I have patience with you. Because he's in you. And Jesus acknowledges this to this man, and he says, listen, you can't do it. I can. And since I can and I'm in you, now you can. Go and do likewise. So let's end where we started. You worship self or you worship your Savior? Or are you somewhere in the middle? You have to answer that question. Self or Savior? All about me, all about Jesus. I can't answer that question for you, but I can tell you this. That this Savior, this guy that Abraham got told about in 42 generations came on the scene, his name was Jesus. And Jesus did live that perfect life. Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus died. He rose again on the third day. He did everything. He loved unconditionally. He hung on the cross and died. My six-year-old grandson sitting at the dinner table the other night was preaching. And he said, did you know they used real nails when they nailed Jesus to the cross? Real nails. For a six-year-old, that was huge. And they, he, they let him hang there till he died. And then they put him in a tomb. And then three days later, he came back to life. That's our Jesus. That's what he did. And while he hung there and died, he looked at the people who literally nailed him to that cross, the people who beat him, the people who put the crown of thorns in his head, and he looked at them and he says, Father, forgive them. We can't do that. I would be very, very angry at that time. But he's filled with the Spirit of God and he says, forgive them. So you can go and do likewise because he's in you. 
He went about the Father's business. We go about the Father's business because he's in us. So don't be afraid when, when you read the list in Galatians today and you're thinking, whoa, Pastor Lynn, I can't do that. No, you can't do that. Acknowledge that and say, hey, I can't, but he can, so now I will. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this for me. He thought enough about each and every one of you that he died for you. That's worth. That's real worth. So next time you leave here, don't go home and put your Galatians 5 on the shelf. Let the Spirit bring it into you. And as you go about the community this week, as you're on Facebook, I don't do a lot of Facebook, but when I do, do do, when I am, there is such an opportunity to witness. Use that tool. Be the Christian you've been called to be. Be the person who says, I love my neighbor. Not because I can, but because he did so, I will. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning for the gift of, of your word that can teach us. I pray that we take it in, let it change our lives. Father, let us take a serious look at our lives. Do we worship self or do we worship you? Let us settle into a routine about community. Let us give with the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness. At the end of the day, let us lay our head down on our, on our pillows and say, Thank you, Jesus. I gave it my best shot today. Give me a night's rest and fill me with your spirit for a new day tomorrow. Father, let us live on this side of glory with the passion and the desire to live out loving our neighbors as ourselves.